Hey everyone, today is September 29th, 2019. I'm in front of St. John the Divine in Morningside Heights. It is 3 o'clock p.m. right now. What is this church? It's crazy looking and we're going to find out all the strange wonders of Morningside Heights, which is a neighborhood that almost no one visits, especially if you're a tourist. As you can tell, it's pretty empty up here. Absolutely. So this is my friend Ariel from Urbanist Life. We're going to take you on a walk through Morningside Heights, through Columbia University, Grant's Tomb. If you like his channel, be sure to check out his Facebook page and his YouTube links. I'll have them down below. But yeah, let's get this walk started. Uh, Action Kid, thank you so much for inviting me again. I'm so excited to show you this amazing neighborhood. Have you oh, been thank to, you. Have you been to Morningside Heights before? I have, but not too much. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So we're in for an adventure. Okay. This is Cathedral St. John the Divine, which is the fifth largest Christian structure in the entire world. The largest cathedral of New York City. And it's not even finished yet. Yeah, no, I think the nickname's called St. John the Unfinished. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> that, is a, that is a very great nickname. Uh, the last New York City mayor, Mayor Bloomberg, said jokingly, um, St. John the Divine will finish in the same time scale that most Gothic cathedrals finish, which is more than 400 years. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so this started being built in the early 1900s. And the reason they ended up building this huge cathedral in uptown Manhattan was because St. St. Patrick's was being built or actually finished construction along Fifth Avenue. Now, St. Patrick's was, is a Catholic cathedral, and a lot of the people who attended the church in its first days were Irish immigrants, poor Irish immigrants, specifically Irish immigrants who were lots of the staff for rich families who were Protestants all around uptown Manhattan. Wow, a look lot at all the sculptures. Yeah. The sculpture work. They're really cool, especially because they're like really long. So the awesome thing about these sculptures is that they don't look ethereal since they tend to have this very elongated um, look to them. They don't look like real humans, so they're almost transcendent. And this started um, shortly after, shortly in the beginning of the medieval era. And there's really cool details. You'll see skulls over here. There's a flying school bus? That's the first time I've noticed Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting one. Here we have like a cool timeline of New York City skyline. Wow, I've never even seen that. And now there's like skulls here. Always look up. Well, that's Halloween. It's October almost. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is so cool. Well, the sculptures are about to get even crazier. Because right next door is a sculpture that has a depiction of the most evil character in Christian mythology, lore, and religion, Satan. You want to check it out? Oh, why not? Right, let's, let's do go. it. Now I'm curious. So we'll come back to this church because we got to walk this way anyway. So we're going to backtrack just a little bit. Actually, let's peek in. Let's peek yeah, why not? The last time I was in here, they were asking for donations if you want to go see the main part of the church. Yeah. Now, this church is the, the fifth largest church in the world, but the longest church in the world. The longest church, huh? Hmm. Mm. So yeah, I don't think we're allowed in because there's a service on. Yeah, being a Christian church, 
there's services every single Sunday. And often there's services throughout the weekdays, but where mostly people attend is on the Sabbath. And so as I mentioned, this church is the fifth largest cathedral, a Christian structure in the entire world, but it's the longest Christian structure in the entire world, longer than Notre Dame, longer than uh, St. Patrick's here in New York City, longer than any other Christian church you can think of. Yeah. But why do, the, why do people barely know about it? I know, when people think about New York City, they think of St. Patrick's Cathedral. They do. So I mentioned that a lot of the um, original goers to St. Patrick's Cathedral were Irish immigrants. The Episcopal um, client, the Episcopal employees, employers of these Irish immigrants were kind of jealous that the Irish immigrants had this grand cathedral that they could attend, yet them being the aristocrats of New York City had no cathedral in their honor. <laughs> they felt vested. <laughs> So they started quickly gathering the money to build this huge cathedral in the Gothic style. However, things get weirder. So let's go around the corner and we'll get a better sense of how big the church is. So this is part of the church, the uh, community grounds? It is, it is. And maybe just maybe we'll spot a peacock, which are usually around here. This woman has been here for nearly a century. It's a sculpture, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> so there's a lot, this is, the, I'm not entirely sure who, uh, who's, who uh, they're depicting, but um, she appears to have been one of the saints that suffered stigmata. The stigmata is, when someone goes through the same injuries that Christ went through when he was being nailed to the cross. Yeah, that looks very, very painful. Yeah, yeah, it does. Okay, so here. And now, now here we're gonna see really like the huge scale of the church, how big it is. Yeah, just take a look at it from here. It's yeah. pretty incredible. There's flying buttresses, though. They're not as big as the ones in Notre Dame, mostly because the actual nave of the church is huge on its own, and the nave is the middle part, mm. which is really long. So what exactly is unfinished about this church? Do you know? We'll see in the back, actually. Yeah, ah. that's a great question. Uh, I'll show it to you. Now, St. John the Divine, why is it barely visited? Well, it's because it never really was, they didn't serve a massive community of hardcore church growers. Unlike the Catholic church where they take going to mass much more seriously or a lot more dedicated to going every single Sunday. Um, that's not so much the case with these Episcopal churches. So you won't see the services being really packed to the brim. However, they've had some major dignitaries here. Uh, dating back to Martin Luther King, they had uh, Mandela as well, and most recently Bill Clinton as well. So here is why the church is unfinished. Oh. <laughs> and that's the case with uh, the interior as well, which we can go in right now. Wow, it's really hidden well. It is hidden well. But if you do want to see the interior, I did a live video Two is that a ago. peregrine falcon there on the corner? It is. Yeah, it is. The, the peregrine falcons are nested on top of the wow, church. Wow, that's incredible. The cathedral. I'm not sure if you can make it out on this camera, but it's there. So there's something weird about the church. It's gothic in the front, but here in the back it starts changing styles. <laughs> So while most, most churches are built in one singular style, maybe Gothic, maybe Byzantine, maybe Romanesque, the architect who was originally hired, Heinz and Lafarge, were removed from, from the project and one of the architects died. So another architect took over and he was under no obligation to continue with the same style. And also tastes in churches changed in the early 1900s. 
a lot of people love that gothic style, but gothic took a whole lot of work because you had to have these huge stones and it would take nearly 400 years to build. But Romanesque style was all the rage. We'll find out, we'll learn about that later on in the tour because we'll see a Romanesque church. Mm. Um, but yeah, Romanesque ended up being all the rage and they ended up changing the style halfway through. And that's why there was a, even a, a bigger slowdown in finishing the church. Yep. And at this rate, it'll be another 100 years at least for the church to be finished. Yeah. <laughs> they estimate between 400 and 700 years. Uh, which, is, which is generally the timeline for most churches to be built. If anyone's watching this video in 400 years time, let us know what you thought about the unfinished church of 2019. Yep, yep. Let us know if it has become the new Notre Dame. Action Kid 105. Yeah. yeah, Action Kid on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, check me out. Check it out. Yeah. Everyone, subscribe. If you're watching this video right now, the Action Kid, press that button. Oh, yeah, smash Twice. that like button. Twice. Go on your other channel and also subscribe. All right, let's. Um... This looks like a buffalo. It's Action Kid 105. It's his channel. Yeah. Well, I dropped the 105, but... Oh, you still, did? They'll still find me, though. All right, cool. Yeah. All right, let's check out the most... Yeah. Action K105 is still my Instagram name. All right, good yeah. to know. Right over there. Oh, the sun's in the way, but... Oh, the sun is double the sun is in the way, because yeah. this sculpture also represents the sun, the moon, ah. nine giraffes, the Archangel Michael, and you'll see. I'd rather, I rather not describe it. We have to see it to believe it. Because we might get demonetized if I were to describe it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can I give a shout out to someone? Oh, why not? Uh, I want to give a shout out to my mom. My mom! <laughs> I want to give a shout out to my brother. Right. Okay. Uh, and to, to Shivraj. Okay. <laughs> All right. Have a good day. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Please don't touch yourself. Please don't touch yourself. Who says that New Yorkers are rude? All New Yorkers are friendly. Yep. In my opinion, this is the most strangest sculpture ever built in New York City. It was built by Greg Wyatt in 1985, and it depicts the Archangel Michael slicing off the head of Satan. What in there. the world is this? Mm -hmm. yep, I can't even tell what's going on. That is uh, the, a headless Satan. Yep. And is that a dragon? No. Now, what's up with these swirly things? Well, those swirly things represent DNA, the double oh. helix of the DNA. Hands in prayer, all fiery prayer, a huge crab. Oh, I didn't even notice that. I thought yeah. that was a dragon's head. <laughs> a crab. It's and a then... crab. Crabs are kind of always depicted along with the underworld, especially in Egyptian mythology. We have, that's the moon, nine okay. giraffes surrounding the Archangel Michael. Now, according to Christian lore, Lucifer was banished down to hell after rebelling against God and heaven. And the Archangel Michael was tasked with taking care of Satan. Here's the sun. Yeah, yeah that's unfortunately sun. you can't see it now because it's too bright. Oh sculpture. yeah, because of the backlight. Yeah. Wow. And now you can see it. So what do you think it means? 
Uh, I don't have a clue at all. <laughs> it's like, it's like I, every single message is in this sculpture. I think most people don't. It's, uh, it's hard to decipher. Let us know in the comments what you originally think it is. I mean, it could be love, peace, like conquering over evil or... <laughs> so it is called the Peace Fountain. You, oh, you got it is. that right. Okay. So what it means is, so we have the double helix of the DNA in the back, in the, in the bottom. Um, we have the juxtaposition of the sun and the moon, the crab and the giraffes. So it's the never ending battle between good and evil. Mm. To Greg Wyatt, he uh, described it more as kind of, it's, uh, it's not usually we depict as good always prevailing over evil. However, he saw, saw the nature of life, especially he built this around the AIDS crisis, crisis of the 1980s. He saw more kind of good and evil always having this never ending battle. So no, never were, was one going to win over the other. They were just an eternal battle forevermore. Mm -hmm. There we go, the craziest sculpture in all of it. And that is the body of Satan. Very veiny man, he seemed to be. And what's this face in the middle supposed to be? This one over here though? Yeah. That's supposed to be the sun. Oh, that's the sun. If I'm correct, that's the moon. The other one's the oh, sun. Oh, that's yeah. the moon. Yeah. But yeah, the moon and the sun are the two faces. I'm sorry if this video is causing anyone nightmares, but <laughs> <laughs> it's a, well, it's a sculpture. <laughs> now, no, there's a few cooler things. This neighborhood has a whole lot of owls. We'll learn about a few more owls as we go along, but here's the first owl we're going to bump into. Now this is all located in a, what is called the Children's Sculpture Garden. So it's a, quite a quaint <laughs> image in the middle of the it Children's is. Sculpture Garden. <laughs> oh, I, I, there's one more cool detail here. I really like this one. Here we have a depiction of Noah and his ark. Noah was the man who after the great flood, right before the great flood, he decided to put two of each animal in this huge massive ship and sail the waters as the entire world drowned so very happy stories very interesting <laughs> also fitting that there's some water here that hasn't dried up yet yeah you're right you're right <laughs> now contrary to the name the peace fountain doesn't actually emit water <laughs> it's not actual fountain more of a fountain, the uh, metaphorical sense. Hi, John, it's good to see you. How are you? Good. So let me point out a food recommendation. Let's cross the street. So by the way, this is Amsterdam Avenue mm -hmm. and 111th Street. Actually, one block south of here is Cathedral Parkway. This, in my opinion, is one of the best pastry shops in New York City. It's called the Hungarian Pastry Shop. Really old school place because it looks straight out of the 1920s. They have really these huge streusels filled with cherries, pr uh, prunes, and a bunch of other different fruits. And also they have just great coffee. Highly recommend it. And it's one of the few places in New York City where you can sit outdoors and not uh, break the bank. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so shall we find another owl lurking in the middle of New York City? Let's go. All right, let's do this. So for that, we have to walk a few more blocks to one of the most prestigious universities in all of America. Which one is it? 
Columbia University. Booyah, Columbia University. Have you been to Columbia before? I have, multiple times. Nice. You done the video? I have. Oh, very cool. But I haven't spoken about it yet. Ooh, okay. Yeah. So I just did a campus tour and it was pretty funny. One time I was at the philosophy hall and there were a bunch of people sleeping and really <laughs> thinking about <laughs> philosophy. It usually happens in philosophy classes. <laughs> Though, uh, if you read my personal writings, uh, I would have been one of the kids awake for that. <laughs> oh, and then another reason you can see it unfinished is that it's only one little tower. Oh. The other one's missing. <laughs> the other one's missing. <laughs> well, it's not missing, it just hasn't been built yet. Ah. Yeah. Right here is an extension of St. John the Divine. They built these like apartment buildings here. Ah. They look really nice. I, li I like the contrast between Gothic slash Romanesque and this kind of modern, modern brutalist style. And that's, that's, that's I think, uh, an overview of kind of um, New York City architecture. You'll find those styles a lot. You'll find the Gothic, the Romanesque, which we're all going to see more as we go to Columbia University. You'll find the Brutal, which is made out of huge blocks of cement. And, and then in Midtown, too, there's a lot of Art Deco. And there's a lot of Art Deco, yes. We're going we're gonna to see kind of like an inspiration of Art Deco. So there's 113th Street. Let's take a let's take a small detour down this block. Oh, why not? Because I think. Does your audience like long videos? Yeah, they do. They do. They All right, it. there we go. <laughs> you may have to split it up though if it gets too long. But <laughs> part one well, and part two. What's your longest one so far? Oh, I've done a five-hour hike in uh, five-hour uh, upper New Upper. Uh, wow. Breakneck Ridge and Cold Spring. <laughs> Oh, interesting. Yeah. Outside New York City. All right. I think my longest one so far in New York City is two and a half hours. Two and a half hours, amazing, yeah. Yeah. I mean, New York City, you can definitely walk for long periods of time and make awesome videos. My, I've done two four-hour videos, one in the Puerto Rican Day Parade. Oh, and then, wow. And then the other one was uh, Jackson Heights, Queens, mm -hmm. which is my hometown. So this is uh, Mount Sinai Hospital. I think it's St. Luke's. Yeah. I think St. Luke's is their children's hospital, but I'm not exactly sure. I think it is, and St. Luke's was one of the first hospitals to fund cancer research. And here it is, ah, there the it original St. Luke's. Original St. Luke's hospital. This is, looks it's, like also a- It's uh, being gutted. I was gonna say Gothic style, but now it looks more European. Yeah, great observation. There's a mansard roof, so very similar to Parisian architecture. But here we have a really cool church on the corner. Because for New York City being uh, a city that, that's often associated with being pretty secular, as opposed to more either more Catholic nations or other types of religious uh, cities, New York has a whole lot of religious structures. And even in the course of five blocks, we're gonna bump into a total of three different churches. Actually four. I'll yeah. point out, there's one actually in Columbia University as well. That's why that block of 110th Street is called Cathedral Parkway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. 
Oh, so they're all scaffolding here. I think it might be blocking the view of the church. Mm -hmm. uh oh, no. Can we no. see in here? No, that's That's not the construction there. site. So here we can see the back of Cathedral of St. John the Divine. And la how long it is. It encompasses the entire city block. And that across the street is Morningside Park. Oh, and I'll show you the best views of Morningside, which you might already know of, but check this out. These are kind of uh, remnants of what you used to need to call the fire department or the police department. All right, let's press it. No. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if they still work though. You, you know what, I'm not entirely sure. I don't think so, I w if I were to venture a guess. That won't be good in an emergency, be pressing that button. <laughs> <laughs> no, it won't. Scaffolding one of New York City's most uniform fixtures upon all around. Yep, if that was a question, I'd be like, what's uh, New York City's most famous architecture? I'd just say, <laughs> <the> scaff scaffolding. <laughs> precisely, <laughs> precisely. Or sidewalk sheds, as we like to call them. Yo, you, you have the fire escapes and then you have the, the scaffolding. <laughs> now this church almost no one really visits. This church is Iglesia de Notre Dame. It's based off a church in Italy. Oh. Done in the Romanesque style. I was even going to ask if this was related to Notre Dame in France. It's not. It's uh, just under the same name. Uh, Notre Dame means my my mother, I think. Mm. If I'm correct, please let me know in the comments. But it's really cool inside. It was built in 18, 1914. Let's see if we can go inside. It's definitely very dirty. It's a lot of dark spots here. Mm hmm Yeah. Alright, let's go in. The Grotto. So it's it's uh, built after a church in Italy also called the Grotto. Hmm. This view is beautiful. I love this. just magical. I highly encourage anyone if you're visiting New York City or if you're a local because I know you have viewers from that are both go inside the churches really always worth it you might bump into beautiful organ playing and it's a free show. Oh That's yeah it. and great architecture inside too. Precisely yeah. There's the back of St. Luke's Hospital. Yeah there turning into condominiums. 
Oh. And by the way, this is a generator, mobile power. Okay, so St. Luke's Hospital is on two separate blocks. Yeah, these hospitals tend to be really huge, and Uptown Manhattan has a higher concentration of them. Just further up, we also have Columbia University Hospital. Oh, this is the women's hospital, he says. Let's go. this way so here we're entering the backside of Columbia University oh there we go here's Columbia University oh yeah the main campus by the way they have another campus I believe uh, in upstate New York Oh, so Uptown Manhattan, they have the campus for their med school. Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. The medical now, school, 165th Street, I believe. Now, Columbia University is one of the oldest organizations, um, educational organizations in all of New York City. It used to go by a different name. And if you're a fan of the Broadway musical Alexander Hamilton, it's mentioned in a few of the lyrics. He went to King's College. King's College was the original Columbia University that was all the way in downtown Manhattan and was started under the parish of Trinity Church. Oh, interesting. But, okay, we're gonna find an owl here. I got very excited about owls because they got a lot of mysterious lore behind them. We'll find out why. Mm. We'll also find out why the Manhattan Project during World War II was called the Manhattan Project. Also, I believe it was called King's College after King George II yep. of England. Yeah, King George the might be the third, hmm. but yeah, either the second or the third, you're right. And here we have a plaque of our man Alexander Hamilton. All right, let's go this way. Okay, I've never seen this sculpture. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> that is freaking me out. Okay, <laughs> and I thought this was not, wasn't going to get any weirder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, didn't think, I think we could go get weirder from uh, the Peace Fountain. <laughs> what is this? It looks like if the Peace Fountain was jumbled up and kind of made into Play-Doh once again. Yeah. Well, maybe we can get close to it once we get into the yeah, let's, campus. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> no offense <laughs> to the artist. That's, just, that's a great reaction to get like, whoa. I think all great art should do that. So we just entered the college walk of Columbia University. Originally known as King's College. Oh, yeah. And in Queens, yeah. there's also a Queens College. But they're not gender. <laughs> <laughs> so, you might recognize this. We talked a little bit about Marvel movies last time we did the Greenwich Village walk. Do you recognize this from a Marvel movie or Marvel property? Um, it's been a long time since I've seen it. I'll give you a hint. He slings webs. Spider-Man. Spider-Man, yeah. Spider-Man in uh, the Sam Raimi movies attends this college and they shot it on location. 
And the room, the lecture room, we can't go in because we're not students, but the lecture room is called Havemeyer Lecture Room. And it's the most film lecture room in all of America. It appears mm -hmm. in countless films aside from Spider-Man as well. So this is the main quad of Columbia University, one of the most prestigious schools in America and also one of the most expensive. It was built on top of an asylum called Bloomingdale Asylum Mental Institution. That used to be the name what people call mental institutions. And the thing is, Bloomingdale Asylum had a secret, intricate network of tunnels underneath. The secret network of tunnels was end up being used for a project that was happening in the midst of World War II. That project was the Manhattan Project. Now, a lot of people say, well, do you know what the Manhattan Project is, first, first of all? Uh... Wasn't that when the United States was developing the atomic bomb? Yes. Yeah. And where, where do you, uh, from, from what you've seen, movies and, and depictions of, of the Manhattan Project, where was it usually located? All the way remember. in the southwest of the U.S., mm -hmm. right? In the desert. Yeah. However, it wasn't just the United States Army being very clever, like, oh, we called it the Manhattan Project just to psych them out. <laughs> so the Soviets think they have to go to Manhattan to steal the plans. No, eh, they called it the Manhattan Project because it actually started here in Manhattan. <laughs> and it started specifically here in Columbia University at Pupin Hall. Now Pupin Hall is further down there, uh, which we'll see in a second. And those intricate, intricate series of tunnels that we're stepping above right now was used for all the employees of the Manhattan Project to navigate themselves around the campus. And the nuclear reactor is still in place here. Before we talk about that, this is the most famous statue in Columbia University, the Alma Mater. Alma Mater is a symbol of universities all around the Western world, and she's based off the goddess Minerva, the Roman goddess Minerva. Roman goddess Minerva is based off the Greek goddess Athena. Mm. Now, who is Minerva? Who is Alma Mater? She is the goddess of knowledge. And being the goddess of knowledge, she is depicted in all these universities, but she has a small little pet with her that represents secret knowledge. Now, this little pet isn't really depicted in Europe because having secret knowledge was frowned against, especially after the persecution of the Knights Templar and then later the persecution of the Freemasons. But here in America, the Freemasons thrived. They built our nation. And the depiction of this little animal it's right here. Almost no one knows about it. Right there. I'll describe it to you in case no uh, people can't make it out. It's an owl. It's a tiny little owl with huge bulging eyes underneath the cloak of the alma mater, aka Minerva. Now, why is the owl hidden underneath the cloak of Minerva? I don't know. Usually the owl is depicted on her shoulder. But the owl is a frequent symbol used in Masonic imagery. You'll see it at one of the most famous uh, Masonic burials in Greenwood Cemetery. So have you done Greenwood Cemetery yet? Not yet. Okay, when you do, be sure to go to uh, the Battle Hill, which is the highest point in Greenwood Cemetery. And you'll see Minerva waving towards the Statue of Liberty. Yeah. <laughs> However, something mysterious happened about 40, 50 years ago. A, someone left the bomb right at the base of Minerva and tried to blow up this statue. No one knows why. What? No one knows who the, who the per perpetrator is, uh, but you still see some dents. And I think some dents might be visible in the back. But luckily the, statue, the bomb wasn't too strong, so it didn't destroy the statue. There we go.
Now you'll see depictions of Minerva in other places, such as Herald Square, definitely many colleges like City College. And you'll see owls also depicted on top of Herald Square. It's a very common motif in New York City. Now, I just wonder if these uh, secret tunnels underneath, what secret knowledge were they holding? Oh, they're holding a secret knowledge of nuclear weaponry. I wonder if we can even get access to one of these tunnels. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> um, stay tuned. <laughs> We can start peering into some of these grates. Precisely. Maybe it'll be in here. Action. Is, there a, is there a secret tunnel Manhattan project here? <laughs> no, I just see leaves. <laughs> That's just the cover up. Uh, Action Kid and Urbanists will be going urban explorer style <laughs> underneath secret tunnels, sewages, <laughs> and on top of bridges. All right, let's uh, find ourselves Pupin Hall. But in the meanwhile, take in the beauty of uh, Columbia University. I'm going. No, oh, go. Cool. I think NYU is more expensive than Columbia for the college tuition. Yes, NYU on average is a little bit higher than 40,000. I think uh, Columbia University is just a few thousand shy. However, on average, the student after receiving financial aid ends up out of pocket paying about 22,000 per year. And a lot of Columbia University students end up also doing graduate school. Mm. So yeah, <laughs> that's for another video. <laughs> I assume uh, just like uh, on my channel, you don't cover politics at all. Nope. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> This, this, um, this statue is really cool. It's a very realistic version of the lion. It's called the Scholar's Lion. Oh, it's I think it's recent. also made by Greg Wyatt. Yeah, it's also made from, from Greg Wyatt, the guy who made the Peace Fountain. <laughs> so Except this again. one is more uh, <laughs> traditional. Than yeah, traditional. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> Uh, do we see any heads? No, no heads. No secret owls here either? No, no hidden owls either. What's hidden under here? I don't know. <laughs> oh, don't, you don't want to look down there. <laughs> now where you do want to look is all are the buildings all around surrounding us. Gorgeous collection of Beaux-Arts buildings. These ones uh, have a little bit more brick in them, but the main building over there and the one with the huge columns, all Beaux-Arts. Now, Beaux-Arts is one of the most famous styles of architecture for New York City because you have the Washington Square Park Arc, you have countless other buildings, also um, Grand Central Terminal. Mm. And this was built by one of the top firms of Beaux-Arts architecture, McKim, Mead, and White. McKim was the one who mostly designed all this, these buildings personally. Let's go to Pupin Hall. And I think that way is that weird sculpture, right? Or is it? Yeah, I think one? we might pop into the. This is the computer center. I think people. The computer right center. Welcome to Pupin Hall. Back in 1943, a Belgian scientist rushed uranium out of Europe and in order to get it right here to the United States of America. The reason is that Nazis wanted some uranium. No one knows for sure why they wanted it. They definitely weren't building a nuclear weapon. But luckily, the United States got its hand on it. 
And they also had a very top scientist called Oppenheimer. And he started working on what was called the Manhattan Project, based here in Pupin Hall, where they still to this day have a nuclear reactor that's used for testing. So yep, we have some nuclear power here in New York City. How maybe, do you feel about that? Maybe that's why there's all this caution tape here. <laughs> We're, we're stepping on some radioactive ground here. You, you do not want to step on that floor. You see how it's a little bit darker than the other yeah. one? Do not do that. <laughs> Wonder where this nuclear reactor is. Hey, well, it's definitely in this building. Let's check it out. Let's visit. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can't. <laughs> we'll be security clearance. Uh, there's also observatory on the back, on um, the top, and they usually have like um, star scene at night especially during the summertime. However, the Manhattan Project ended up being too, too sensitive of a project to have located here in New York City. They knew that various Soviet spies were based here in New York City, including Carl Fuchs, who was one of the most productive of the spies, and he actually ended up getting a lot of intel uh, to Russians who were based in Long Island. He would usually take the Long Island Railroad, trade the information that was happening here in Pupin Hall, and then they would take it back to Soviet Russia. That might be the reason why the Soviets end up getting the atomic weapon just a mere few year or two after the U.S. unleashed the bombs in Japan. Hmm. So the Manhattan Project because of its vulnerabilities to all the Soviet spies lurking around this great city, they end up moving out to the deserts of the southwest of the United States of America. There we go, yeah, the rest is history. For that, we'll, you'll tune in to part three of this video where we'll go over to Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> All right, let me, uh, let's actually go through, through here. I'll point out a great coffee shop. All right. That's accessible to the public. I wonder when this building was built, it's like really new compared to the old one. Yeah, much newer. If I were to venture a guess, I would say 90s. You can usually tell by uh, those more modern fixtures. Can we go through here? I think we can. So here inside Columbia University, there's an area open to the public indoors. And it's one of the best coffee chains in New York City. It's Joe Coffee. And they have an outpost here. So highly recommend grabbing coffee here. They do mm. every type of drink well, cold brew, lattes, espresso, etc. Oh, well, by the way, if you haven't checked out his best coffee shops video, yeah. you gotta check it out. It's oh, amazing. Thank you, yeah. And today is National Coffee Day. Oh, September perfect. 29th, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's uh, continue. Do you drink coffee? Not too often. Not too often. Yeah. I used to, but I don't really react too well to it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Inside this building has the largest pool in all of New York City. This is fun fact, also it's very old. And alongside you'll see names of major American heroes. We have, well, Columbus being, uh, Americans really admire Columbus, especially mm. many uh, decades ago. So Columbus is on there. But we have George Washington, we have Hamilton, Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Webster, and many, many others. So there's the Teachers College. That's the Teachers College, yeah. And then over here we have uh, Bay, uh, Barnard. And Barnard was traditionally the women's university. 
I think it's been recently converted to co-ed, if I'm correct, but yeah, it used to be the women's university. And the reason for that is, is Columbia University used to be all male, so they had it segregated. Oh, wow. Yeah. And this is the M60, which um, you've taken yourself. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I actually took it to get here. It's a it's great... Pretty, it's pretty good to get to the airport. It's a great, it's a great bus to see both this area of Manhattan and go across the bridge, Triborough Bridge, to Queens. So here we have yet another church. Well, this That's one, also unfinished. <laughs> it seems like it, yeah. but I don't think so. I think they're just repairing it. But this, this is not the church that we're going to talk about. One what just across the corner. What architectural style is this church? Scaffolding. <laughs> Scaffolding. <laughs> this one also appears to be Gothic. Uh, 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 right there, we see that massive tower, 392 feet tall. Riverside Church, the, law, the tallest church in all of America. By the way, this uh, part of Manhattan is a very uh, popular route for people to take their bicycles to go over the George Washington Bridge for road cycling. The cool thing is you can still hear the birds sing. Mm. Now, I think the Protestants of New York weren't satisfied with the St. John, the unfinished, as you said. <laughs> <laughs> so they end up basically building a skyscraper of a church. It was modeled after La Own Cathedral in Charles, France. And it was uh, made by, well, it was supported and funded by John D. Rockefeller one of the richest men in America during the late 1800s, early 1900s. It's gorgeous. Yeah, and the way the sun's shining on it now is perfect. Yeah, precisely. Usually they close early, so I don't think we can get in. But another cool thing about this church is that it has the largest uh, Carillion Pardon my pronunciation on that. That is the large, the heaviest set of bells in the entire world. Amongst the heaviest set of bells in the entire world. Mm -hmm. However, right in front of this church is a monument that used to be one of the most famous visited monuments in all of New York City. And today, no one who comes. <laughs> I think it's because Almost no one knows the man who is attributed to, Ulysses S. Grant. Now, of course, if you're a history lover or, or someone who took American history in high school and college, of course, you'll know the name Ulysses S. Grant. Um, but Ulysses S. Grant is one of the most famous national war heroes of the late 1800s because he helped the North win the Civil War. Let's walk right to it. Yeah, take a look at this tower here, Riverside Church. Yeah. There's also gargoyles on top of it. Yeah, I don't think we can get in here. The doors seem closed. They do, yeah. Usually they don't allow cameras inside. Believe me, I tried many times. <laughs> I've, I've, I've done a few videos on this church. Mm. 
You might be able to see some carabine falcons on the top too. What, what did you say? I said you might be able to see some carabine falcons on the top too. Yes, de and definitely this church. They're all the way in the very top of the tower. Is that one right there? Wow. Yeah, I think he just flew away. I was just mentioning about <laughs> it. And <I> flew <laughs> so cool. in. So when you're visiting New York City, be careful of predatory birds. They're around. <laughs> I've heard stories of them like snatching up little dogs too. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Not all news is real news. <laughs> Don't spread fear, actually. Kid. They do. They do kill a lot of pigeons, though. Pigeons used to have no natural predators in New York City. But then the Falcons started uh, invading New York and killing all the pigeons. That's why there's no pigeons here. Where are they? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they dared to come here. So here we go. Ulysses S. Grant's tomb. Now, I have a question for you, Action Kid, and for all the audiences out there. Mm -hmm. Who is buried at Grant's tomb? Ulysses S. Grant. Wrong. What? Ulysses S. Grant isn't buried at Grant's tomb. He's interred here, or he's entombed here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a joke that people used to say uh, for nearly 100 years. It tends to be in many textbooks. And um, it's not so funny nowadays, but <laughs> it used to be said all the time. And actually, uh, him and his wife are inter uh, both entombed here. Now, I did go in here one time in a video and it was way too dark. It is very dark. Yeah. Have you tried with the GoPro? Yeah, I used the GoPro. We'll do our best because I think it's yeah. worth uh, showing a little bit inside. It is. Um, I may have to turn my uh, camera settings up. All right, yeah. Yeah. So Ulysses has Grant actually didn't grow up being a soldier whatsoever. However, the Mexican War started and he went to the call and he really stuck out at that war as one of the top uh, leaders, invading all the way to Monterrey, Mexico, and meeting Abraham Lincoln. But by the time the Civil War came, general after general kept failing. The South, a lot of people thought, was going to win the war. So Abraham Lincoln was desperate. And he heard rumors of this uh, general who was fearless. Luckily, that general ended up being Ulysses S. Grant, and he lived up to his name. He did anything necessary to win a battle. Unfortunately, sometimes that meant sending the massive amounts of Union Army soldiers towards the front lines and he ended up getting the nickname at least according to the south grant the butcher however nonetheless ulysses s grant ended up winning the war for the union army and abraham lincoln was going to the theater the ford theater in washington dc if you know american history you know you end up know you end up you know what happens. But what people don't know, a lot of people don't know, is that Ulysses S. Grant was asked by Abraham Lincoln to come to the theater that night. Grant loved the theater himself too, and Lincoln and Grant both bonded over that. However, Grant telling his, telling his wife, hey, let's go to the theater with Lincoln, his wife hated Mary Todd Lincoln and he convinced Ulysses S. Grant to cancel the plans. So Grant, embarrassingly so, came over to Lincoln and said, sorry, it can't go this night. Unfortunately, that night, John Wilkes Booth ended up shooting Lincoln at the back of the head. Grant ended up living that day because he didn't go. Andrew Johnson ended up taking the presidency and he was a South sympathizer. And he was in, he was backtracking a lot of Lincoln's progress, especially after freeing the slaves. 
So Grant ended up running against Andrew Johnson, winning the presidency and bringing back glory to the Union. And that's why he was very well loved, especially by the North. So much so that he was a national hero. He wasn't the best president, according to many historians, but he was definitely well liked. And in 1895, when he passed away, tens of thousands of people attended his funeral. It was completely packed to the brim with people over here. And for the subsequent two, three decades or so, thousands upon thousands of people visited here every single month, maybe even more than that. It was definitely the top tourist attraction in all of New York City. Now he ended up, they end up modeling this uh, tomb after another famous general. We're gonna see inside, let's go inside. So let's go inside. So we have two tombs right over here. One is Ulysses S. Grant, and the other one his wife, the woman who saved his life because of her hatred of Mary Todd Lincoln. Now these tombs might look very familiar, especially if you've visited Paris, because in Paris there is Les Invalides, and inside Les Invalides is Napoleon's tomb, which is designed the same exact way. And also the entire uh, structure itself is also based on the seven leads. Up there we see murals of different stages of Grant's life, uh, public life. One, the general during the Mexican-American War, the other one being a statesman in the middle. And over here, a uh, general during the Civil War. Oh, and this is the uh, old American flag here. Oh, yeah. It reads 11th Regiment Individual Volumes. I'm not sure what IMD stands for. Hmm. Let's check this out. Here we have a map of all the different battles fought between the Union Army, which is the North, and the Confederate Army, which is the South. One of the most pivotal battles being right here at Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter ended up being a huge turning point in the war, with the Union Army uh, winning, but at huge, huge cost. And here we have flags of different regiments and battalions and artillery, etc. And this is marble. You'll see this a lot in Beaux Arts architecture. Downstairs. This is cool. Yeah. It's usually closed. Yeah, sometimes they close it. Yeah. Oh, well, it's nice. So, this is actually a national monument uh, run by the uh, National Parks Association or agency. Um, and and uh, all the 
tend to always be free to enter. Here we have Shreden, uh, who's another famous general of the Union Army. He has a park named after him right in front of Stonewall Tavern in Greenwich Village. McPherson. He does look very fierce. <laughs> very, very fierce. <laughs> look at those beards. That beard is just, uh, <laughs> comes right at you. Exactly. Sherman, ooh, General Sherman. This guy, this guy, the most notorious one of them all. He ended up um, being absolutely brutal, especially in burning up a bunch of different cities around Georgia, including burning down Atlanta. Now, General Sherman ended up really shaking fear into the Southern Army because he um, had this kind of scorched earth policy. And to many Southerners, especially if you were uh, a civilian, it almost felt like it was the apocalypse because everything around me was being burnt. of the generals are very similar to Les Invalides, Napoleon's tomb in Paris, because also in the tomb he has a lot of his own generals depicted and buried with him as well. Here I don't think they're buried. But we have one more story. We've seen a bunch of monuments that are built one monument that's still not finished, St. John the Divine. But one monument, or one tomb, that was close to being built. And if it were to be built, it would end up being the most strangest thing to have reigned over the New York City skyline, even stranger than Peace Mountain. For that, let's continue outside. I wonder what this is going to be. Oh, you'll find out. <laughs> Think about alma mater. If a crazed millionaire from New York City's aristocracy end up getting his way, we would have been greeted with a huge owl lurking right in front of Grant's tomb. Now, remember the owl underneath alma mater? Well, there was one particular industrialist or a millionaire. His name was Joseph Gordon Bennett, and he ran the New York Herald, which was one of the top newspapers in New York City. Ended up becoming the, uh, the New York Post many, many decades later. And he was obsessed with owls. Obsessed with Minerva, he had a statue of Minerva in front of his um, in front of his office. But Joe James Gordon Peterson had owl pets, dozens upon dozens of owls in his office for the New York Herald, and also he had owl statues with glowing green eyes on top of the offices of the New York Herald. Why was Joseph Gordon Bennett so obsessed with owls? Well, according to legend, no one knows if the story is 100% true, Joseph Gordon Bennett was sailing on a yacht across the uh, coast of America during the Civil War, and his ship was nearly intercepted by the Confederate Army. However, late at night, he heard the hooing of an owl, kept hooing on and on and on. And this was strange for an owl to be hooing off the coast on the ship. Owls hang out usually amongst the trees. Luckily, that owl ended up, in a way, waking up Gordon Bennett very early in the night, 
and him being alerted that the Confederates were coming, threatening his ship. What's with all these colorful benches over here? Oh, those are, that. yeah, that's a mosaic. I think it's uh, the same artist that we saw in the East Village with mm. the light poles. Oh, yeah. Doesn't look to be maintained very well. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, people barely visit this uh, monument anymore. Civil War history. Everyone who lived through the Civil War has passed. And most family members who had family members that were in the Civil War have also passed. Goes to show maybe what's going to happen with our World War II monuments in 10 mm. years. So Joseph Gordon Bennett wanted at his death to be buried or to be entombed in the middle of a 200 foot owl built by one of the top architects of all of New York City, Stanford White, who built all these beautiful Beaux-Arts buildings, including Washington Square Park Arc. That ended up then that they end up coming true, but the original plans was Bennett to be um, hung, his body to be, his coffin to be hung in chains in the middle of the owl so he can forever be this huge owl <laughs> if for all eternity. I don't know why the pa plans That's were, the, yeah, it is strange. I don't know why the plans end up being uh, canceled. I think it might be due to Stanford White's death, who was shot by a crazed man-man who was uh, the husband of his mistress. So <laughs> Stanford White ended up being dead uh, before Joseph Gordon and Bennett passed away. Be Bennett passed away, so no one took over the project. But if Stanford White would have survived, we could have been faced with the 200-foot owl in front of Grant's tomb. And that's the strange parts of New York City. That's why New York City is filled with all these mysterious wonders all around, as you see in many Action Kids videos. So when you're in New York City, go explore, go wander around. And thank you so much, Action Kid, for having me. All right. Well, that's it for this video, everyone. Hope you enjoy this long walk throughout Morningside Heights. We got to see a lot of crazy things out here. This amazing sculpture of Peace Fountain <laughs> oh, yeah. Columbia University in Riverside Church. Uh, got to see a few cathedrals and Grant's tomb. But yeah, check out his channel, his uh, Facebook page, and uh, subscribe if you haven't already to both our channels. Like down below and I'll see you all next time. Take it easy. Bye-bye.